tonight on CBC Vancouver News. For those lawyers to stand there and defend themselves and those RCMP is beyond unjust and absolutely blasphemy. The family of a man who died in RCMP custody in Prince George is angry the Crown is no longer pursuing manslaughter charges against Mounties associated with his death. And... It feels fun to be here with my new family. A new life in Canada. A South African girl arrives in Vancouver at the end of a long legal battle. Hello, I'm Dan Burrard. Thanks for joining us. Breaking news to share with you. The RCMP in Langley says the Amber Alert issued for a missing three-month-old boy is now over. Mounties say the baby and his mother were found safe and sound at Langley Memorial Hospital in the afternoon after hospital staff called them. It's still not clear what led to the child being taken away on Thursday afternoon. Again, though, the RCMP says a missing three-month-old boy taken from around 72nd and 200th Street in Langley on Thursday that prompted an Amber Alert has been found safe along with his mother. We'll bring you any other updates later in the show and online at cbc.ca slash bc. The daughter of a man who died in RCMP custody in Prince George years ago says her faith in the justice system is wavering. This after Crown lawyers announced they are no longer pursuing manslaughter charges against Mounties associated with his death. Andrew Kuryata has more on why the charges were stayed. The day opened with drumming as roughly 100 people gathered outside the Prince George courthouse. They were there to support the family of Dale Culver. Our journey for justice for Dale, it doesn't end here. A 35 year old Gitsan Witsuwetan man who died in police custody shortly after being arrested in 2017. Police say he matched the description of someone casing cars, while family say he was simply biking home. After a struggle with police, he collapsed and died. Two RCMP officers were charged with manslaughter. The original pathologist report said Culver died in part because of blunt force trauma to the head. But today, Crown lawyers announced that original report had been deemed faulty, and a review found Culver actually died of a heart attack, made worse by the altercation with police and the use of methamphetamine. Because of this, Crown lawyers no longer feel they can pursue the case. Lily Speed Namox was just 14 when her father died. For those lawyers to stand there and defend themselves and those RCMP is beyond unjust and absolutely blasphemy because the fact is is that whether or not my dad had a heart condition or not what caused the heart attack was those RCMP officers. Debbie Pierre is Culver's cousin. This has been a seven year journey for our family to endure all of this pain and heartache. We need to start looking at the justice system right now because what they're saying is that it did not meet the threshold of the judicial system. The BC Civil Liberties Association has been supporting Culver's family in the case. They say they are disappointed with today's decision. It's just disgusting that after waiting so long for some form of public accountability, this, this is the result. There is still an obstruction of justice court case being pursued against three other Mounties. It's alleged that witnesses to Culver's death were intimidated into deleting video evidence. No date for that trial has been set, but the RCMP officers charged have all pleaded not guilty. Meanwhile, Culver's family say they want an independent inquiry into what happened. Andrew Kriata, CBC News, Prince George. Mounties in Creston say two people have been killed and another is critically injured after a crash on Highway 3 on Thursday. Police say two vehicles collided head-on around 5.30 p.m. near Kitchener. Both drivers, a 33-year-old woman and a 65-year-old man, were di who died at the scene. One passenger in the westbound vehicle was rushed to hospital. Investigators say alcohol may have been a factor in that crash. Well, it has taken years and caused a lot of frustration for parents, guardians, and kids. But the B.C. government now says a much-needed school is one step closer to finally being built in Vancouver's Olympic Village. As Michelle Morton reports, families have been waiting for more than a decade. Every B.C. family has things they care about most. Here in Olympic Village, education has been top of mind for many. Right beside me here, this patch of grass was earmarked to be a school more than 15 years ago. 
Then in 2020, during a provincial campaign, the BC NDP promised to fast track the school. She's going to get a school built. This means a new school right here in Olympic Village. Around 10,000 people call Olympic Village home, and families who took to heart that promise four years ago have been wondering when or even if construction will break ground. But Education Minister Rachna Singh finally gave a hint. Our government is providing $150 million in funding to build a brand new elementary school here in Olympic Village. She says the four-story school will have capacity for 630 students. Seems like we could fill a quarter of that just from our, our building alone. It's obviously way overdue and, and a long time coming, so you know, let's just hope they can meet that schedule. It's amazing to hear because apparently there are not a lot of spaces available in schools right now, so just having another school close by that it's new. It's an opportunity for families that don't have like a current school available right now. There could be other sites that would be better suited to the school. And people really use that, that lawn and have for many years, so it's a shame to take it away. Well, I think there's a lot of new parents, especially in this area, as well as ours. Um, and I think everyone's just looking for new schools just because getting your kids in a school program can be very competitive and can take a long time. So. The more schools for that, probably the better. The new school is expected to be completed in the fall of 2029. Michelle Morton, CBC News, Vancouver. A coalition of First Nations has released what they say is a textbook for salmon farming in B.C. As original stewards since time immemorial, now we can use our traditional ecological knowledge and integrate that with Western science and stewardship programs to create a holistic understanding of what is going on in our marine territories. First Nations say they want to build indigenous-led science capacity on our coast. The document is a 500-page review of data on salmon farming, its connection to the economy of coastal communities, and the state of wild Pacific salmon. It comes as Ottawa prepares to make a decision on whether to reissue fish farming licenses later this year. Iona Campanolo, BC's first female lieutenant governor, has died. In 2022, she spoke about what she hoped her legacy would be. You have to think of women who were not able to do this over the centuries. And we are. We're given an open door. And that's why we have to challenge, meet the challenge and, and be, be gracious about it. Campanolo served as lieutenant governor from 2001 to 2007. Before that, she was the MP for Skeena from 1974 to 79. She also served as federal minister of sports for then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. Former BC Finance Minister Carol Taylor did that 2022 interview. She spoke about Campanolo's life on, on the coast. She just makes me feel um, inspired. <laughs> makes me feel like we never stop working. She just had so much strength throughout her life. And the way she approached every job she had, and heaven knows how many she had, but she did it with enthusiasm. Campanolo also served as president of the federal Liberal Party. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau says Campanolo was a proud British Columbian and a role model for women in politics. Iona Campanolo was 91 years old. Housing affordability is top of mind for many British Columbians, and for some that means getting creative, if not adventurous, when it comes to money. The CBC's Benit Breach shows us how one group of complete strangers teamed up to achieve their dreams of home ownership. On the banks of Howe Sound off of West Vancouver, nestled next to the ocean and mountainous vistas are these charming cottages. It feels this... like a fairy tale here, truly. <laughs> yes, it uh, does. <laughs> here in Horseshoe Bay, detached homes cost at least $2 million. For Heidi Woodley and her neighbours, owning these cottages felt like a dream, simply out of reach. But it came true, thanks to the help of strangers turned neighbours and some like-minded investors. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm very happy. Yeah. Some days I pinch myself. Oh, hey, that you want to come in? This isn't a commune, rather. It's a fantastic relationship. You've got people there when you need them. Splitting mortgages through co-ownership is one way some British Columbians are trying to own homes amid BC's housing crisis. There's no possible way I'd be able to buy anything. Uh, I'd be renting and it would be probably not the best rental. 
So how did they make it happen? Well, Woodley started renting this place in 2020. She fell so in love with it, she wanted to buy it. Her landlord, who owned the cottages for nearly 30 years, said he'd only sell eight of them together. Soon, the cottages were listed for $3.8 million, far out of financial reach. Of course, you see the sign and your heart just plummets. You feel that feeling. It, it, it is heartbreaking. But things changed wow. when a realtor suggested she try co-ownership. Now, co-ownership can take many forms. Generally, it allows a group of people on the land title and includes one mortgage, and people pay their own share. But it's not always easy. It can take time to find reliable co-owners, it can be tough to get financing, and careful attention is needed for legal agreements, say if someone divorces, dies, or wants out. Here, since they are a large group of a dozen co-owners, Woodley and her neighbors made a company. Each of them are shareholders of the entire half-acre property. Each person here also has a monthly fee based on the square footage of their cottage. Um, we have insurance, we have utilities, taxes, common amenities as well. But getting to this point took a lot of patience, legal meetings and hope. For months, Heidi and Matt struggled to find buyers. When they finally had enough, the banks wouldn't budge on financing the group. It was tumultuous. It was, you know, a wild time. <laughs> After waiting and waiting, there was a twist. Meet Alan Carpenter. He heard of the group's financial struggles and wanted to help. When people come in community, we can create solutions that can find different ways of doing things. Carpenter is a retired builder, and he's lived in co-housing for the last 28 years. He and his friends and family offered $2.5 million to help Woodley and her neighbors. And I want to make an impact. He hopes his return on the investment in the future can be used to help others in a similar situation. You know, I wish it could be possible for for anyone who wanted this sort of life. The group is still trying to get financing from banks, but for now, they've had a unique housing solution for affordability challenges far too common. Beneath Breach, CBC News, West Vancouver. People in Penticton are mourning a big community loss. It wasn't a person that died, though. It was a Canada goose. The broken-winged goose named Kevin was beloved by many there, and while no Foul play is suspected. The CBC's Leanne Young spoke with Jason Proctor about the legacy Kevin leaves behind. So, Jason, hundreds of people are set to attend this bird's celebration of life this weekend. Tell us the story of Kevin here. Okay, this is Kevin, the broken-winged goose. And he basically was this fixture on the uh, shorefront of Okanagan Lake. Hmm. Seems to have had this amazing ability to bring this ragtag little group of people together. And, you know, they would feed him. Uh, I spoke to one woman who, you know, she'd go there with her toddlers every day and they call every goose Kevin now. Uh, you can see these pictures here. These were taken by a budding photographer who basically says, Steve here, basically says Kevin would almost kind of pose for him, you know. And so, uh, you he know, He looks very know. majestic. He was very majestic and for some reason he really struck something with the hearts of people in Penticton. He died on Good Friday. He was attacked by a dog, a dog also was the culprit behind the broken wing. Mm. Um, and so actually a group of these people rushed him to a veterinarian in Kelowna. They couldn't save him ultimately. It was thought, you know, he kind of was without a wing and he couldn't do without a leg as well. So he had to be put down. But now this group's kind of sprung up to, to remember him and to kind of share stories about him on Sunday. And so how did he win the hearts of, of so many people? Because like hundreds are supposed to go to his, his, his wake, I guess. You know, I've been thinking about this so much of what we hear about the world is is bad news. It, it's unhappy. It's it's violence and mayhem. I cover it myself all the time. Mm -hmm. What you hear here is people being good. They are helping a vulnerable animal. You know, they had no. We didn't know possibly what was going on, but it was something that drew them together and made them a little community of strangers that, that came together to do something good for for each other and for him. You know what? It's interesting because we do a lot of animal stories. I think some of us were unconvinced about Kevin, but I, th I feel like the story has won you over even. I am a Kevin convert. <laughs> okay, well, you know what? Rest in peace, lovely Kevin and, and that group getting together this weekend. Uh, I'm sorry for their loss. And thank you to you, Jason Proctor, for that story. Thank you.
A Vancouver photographer has won the prestigious Edward Bertinsky Award for climate photojournalism. Jesse Winter was selected for a series of photos documenting BC's devastating 2023 wildfire season. He spoke with CBC reporter Karen Larson about gaining the trust of firefighting crews on the front lines and what it means to win an award from one of his heroes. It means a lot of things. I'm I'm still a little bit in shock. I mean, even to be like associated with Edward Bertinsky and his work is an incredible honor. So that picture was made just outside of Vanderhoof, BC, um, and it shows uh, an Alaskan firefighter named Carson Long. Um, he's part of a smoke jumper unit, so firefighters would parachute out of planes to re to reach really remote wildfires. You do have to build a lot of trust, and in some cases, you kind of have to do that very quickly. They're not used to seeing journalists in these spaces. They're not used to the idea that their work is public. So that second photo uh, was made in um, just outside Scotch Creek. What I think you see in that photo is something that I saw all summer was the, just the levels of exhaustion that these firefighters were facing. That's uh, that's a Soyuz. I was standing at the top of Anarcha Summit with a long telephoto lens. It was about 3 a.m. in the morning. What you see in that image, the triangle shape is, is the that's Canada Customs. That's the, the Canada-US border. Um, and I think w what I was hoping to show is that these issues are not domestic. These are global issues. They, they don't respect international borders and we have to stop thinking about them in, as though they do. Getting the access to make these kind of pictures is something that I've been working towards for years. And I think there's more work to be done um, on that front, but I think this, it, it is a little bit of a validation that that work wasn't in vain. Karis Hogg is in for Darius Madavi tonight. Welcome, your first forecast on the 6 o'clock show. Thank you so much, Dan. Yep. I'm very excited to yes, be here. And we coordinated with the Greens, so thank you for Yeah, you've got a tip. little green in your tie. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's nice. So, lovely day out there. If Beautiful. for anybody was outside, what about the weekend? Uh, well, not as lovely. <laughs> <laughs> not put too fun a point on it. <laughs> Today, ab absolutely stunning, really, uh, for much of the province and for the south coast. A little few little scattered showers here and there, but really, you know, the past 12 hours have just been uh, quite delightful if you're a kind of person who likes sun. Um, but as we move into the weekend, you can see our precipitation forecast. We're going to be getting a lot more rain in elsewhere in the province. The south coast, not super wet on Saturday and Sunday, but we are going to get some cloud and some scattered showers for sure um, and then here you can see we're looking at Metro Vancouver here you can see these scattered showers are just going to kind of you know dance over us a little bit Saturday into Sunday but we are going to get uh, some snow it looks like a dusting of snow on the North Shore Mountains and tonight into early tomorrow uh, still lovely evening sunset at 750 mainly sunny Overnight, low of five, but the cloud is going to start building, and then by tomorrow morning, very cloudy. Okay, we'll survive it, and we'll check in later. Thanks, okay. Chris. A South African girl is starting a new life with her Canadian family right here in BC. It marks the end of a complex and long legal saga that stretched on for years and began with tragedy. The CBC's Yvette Brend has been following her story and was there the moment she touched down. It's been a long wait for this family embrace on Canadian soil. I've been waiting. What was that like? It was... It was kind of hard. Imagine. And what does it feel like today? It feels fun to be here with my new family. A fresh start after a traumatic loss. Three years ago, Riley Ridland's mother died suddenly. Riley was found surviving alone with her mother's body on a remote property in South Africa. Then, only seven years old, she'd somehow survived alone for more than a week in stifling 40-degree heat, eating only peanut butter and noodles. Ever since the tragedy, her great aunt has been fighting to adopt her and bring her to Canada. We are talking about a vulnerable little girl who has been abused, neglected, and abandoned. In February, Riley finally won the right to apply for permanent residency in Canada on compassionate grounds. Her lawyer says this case illustrates the complexity of international adoptions. 
think that we have to think in Canada about how rigidly we want to adhere to our conceptions of family and who constitutes family. You're coming to Canada. This is the moment in February when she discovered she was finally coming to Canada. After that, flights were booked, goodbyes were said. Then a long journey to Vancouver, ending here. What really got me was when the um, officer said, congratulations, you are now Canadian citizen. That to me was like, wow, it's worth it. She did an incredible happy dance then. Now, Riley's new life begins. Yvette Brent, CBC News, Vancouver. It is the last week of Ramadan. After the break, a look into how one student combines her faith with community activism. Stick around. And thanks for joining us on our commercial-free live stream tonight. PEI beef will soon hit stores more than 10,000 kilometers away. It's heading to a new market, Japan. Wayne Thibodeau tells us why. We believe Japan is where we want to be as a way to start. Atlantic Beef Products in Albany is playing host this week to a business leader and chef from Japan. It all started with a food show in Tokyo last month. Food X Japan is the largest food show in Asia, attracting more than 80,000 people, many of them grocery store buyers and wholesalers. There was a lot of interest by a lot of different wholesalers and importers on our product. Uh, we've tried to pick uh, a couple that we think will be good fits for us and we're working with those folks now to get orders uh, put up and shipped over to Japan. Frozen sea containers is how it's going to be going. So it'll be put up frozen here, shipped to Halifax by sea container. It takes about 60 days to get there. Most of the beef produced at the island plant is now sold in eastern Canada. This will be its first shipments overseas. Japanese consumers aren't that interested in beef tenderloin ribeye, but they're very interested in uh, very thin sliced meats that they can use for soups and noodle bowls. I visit a uh, couple farms, ranches, and uh, they are very, very nice. And I touched the cattle and uh, I tasted uh, feed and animal feed, and uh, it was good. Very, very impressed, actually, yes. So you actually test the feed? Yes, okay. that, that's my job. <laughs> taste even, um, you, know, you know, cattle can eat, why I cannot eat? Judah Shabata says he fell in love with PEI beef when he first tasted it at the trade show, but hasn't made a deal yet here. His friend operates 140 grocery stores in and around Tokyo. Shabata is confident, but there are challenges. PEI, it's a little too far away from uh, Japan and uh, very big challenge to ship to Japan in uh, chilled conditions and also reasonable place. Do you suppose that it could but PEI does have one advantage, a red-headed girl called Anne of Green Gables. Lucy Maud Montgomery's books are well known in Japan and that prompted interest in PEI beef at the trade show. We definitely have a leg up in Japan, say, over many other Asian countries. And, and you know what? If you've got that advantage, it only makes sense to try and leverage it. Now, will, will there be Anna Green Gables beef available in Japan at some point down the road? That's yet to be negotiated. The first shipments of beef headed to Japan leaves this plant later this month. There'll be more shipments in May and June. 24 metric tons will be shipped each month. Plant officials hope that is just the beginning. Wayne Tibeto, CBC News. Albany. It is the last week of Ramadan when many Muslims are the most active in their communities, whether they're organizing fundraisers or hosting gatherings at a local mosque. But the way community work is defined doesn't look the same for everyone. 
Balkis Jama is an SFU student studying communications and international relations, uh, has been an advocate for black students on campus, calling for better mental health supports and for more black faculty. And you join us now. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. So why is it important to, to expand uh, the anti-racism organizing you're doing in advocacy to Muslim spaces? I think anti-racism work is relevant to all spaces. Mm -hmm. I just happen to be a Muslim, so I do that work within my spaces too. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, all that means is making spaces safe and inclusive and accessible for everybody. Um, Islam puts such a big emphasis on justice and inclusion and that everyone is equal. So those are some core Islamic tenets. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I should note that there isn't one Muslim community. It's, yeah, not, yeah. it's not homogenous. How do you have those conversations about, for example, race, identity with, with Muslims who have different perspectives? Um, we encourage, or Islam encourages us to have dialogue. We're, supp we're supposed to have these uh, conversations, ask each other questions. Um, it's even mentioned in the, in the Quran, like our holy book, about how everyone is, we've made these different tribes and these different nations for you to get to know one another. So mm -hmm. it is quite a big, um, a, yeah, a big a, important part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and do you find it challenging work? I think it can be, just like anything. I don't think the challenges in my community are necessarily unique to my community, mm -hmm. um, but they are conversations worth having because they are my spaces. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And speaking of community, you are, are Somali, is that right? I am. And so as Ramadan comes to an end, are there any um, specific um, uh, traditions or, or concepts that, that you carry forward at this time? Um, for the most part, when it comes to the religious aspect, it's kind of the same across all cultures. Mm -hmm. but. I think every household, every culture has their own little thing, like rituals that they like to do, non-religious ones. But I mean like cultural foods, foods are so important to all our cultures. So Somali foods, like we have our East African sambusas, mm -hmm. we have this soup called shurba, which is like oats and meat. And yeah, it really reminds me of home. Lovely. Well, Case Jama, we appreciate your time and your expertise and sharing it with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. <laughs> With job numbers stalling, young people are finding it harder to get work and keep it. The struggle for new graduates after this. It's a normal day out here now, but on Monday at eclipse time, it will be much different out here. Christina Hare doesn't expect her dog to notice, but they won't be out here walking during it. I'm not really concerned because she does sleep really well during the night, um, so I don't think it'll throw her off too much. She might have a nap and I'll make sure to maybe not take her outside during that time. Specialists in animal behavior say an eclipse can cause pets or farm animals to act differently, especially if they're already nervous. This could set them off just a little bit. Um, the big response that is reported is one of nonspecific fear or anxiety, simply because this is so uncertain. Dr. Karen Overall says animals often act as they would at nighttime, but they might also think it's a storm, which could be stressful. For larger animals, having some kind of shelter or a barn can help. Trainers at this Charlottetown track plan to keep their horses in the barn, which is also a darker environment. I'm not necessarily, I don't really know if it would harm them or not, but to be on the safe side, just keep them in the barn and just when it kind of passes and then kind of go about your everyday, everyday thing pretty well. Miles Heffernan says it makes sense to protect human and animal eyes, and vets agree. There, there are people who will have, will have goggles for their dog. This veterinarian says it is harder to control larger animals, but pets should be kept inside if they're at risk of looking at the sun. Some animals are far more sensitive to different types of light than we are. So, you know, you'd want to be, you'd want to be a little careful there. In the past, researchers have reported birds gathering on the ground and looking at the eclipse, and some primate animals in zoos have pointed at it, and cows have thought it's milking time. Experts say it's good to plan ahead to keep animals safe. Laura Meter, CBC News, Charlottetown.
Back to our top story now. RCMP says the Amber Alert issued for a missing infant in Langley is now over. Mounties say the baby and his mother were found safe at Langley Memorial Hospital this afternoon after hospital staff called them. It's still not clear what led to the child being taken away yesterday afternoon, but again, Mounties say the infant who has been missing after being taken from 72nd Avenue and 208th Street in Langley on Thursday has been found safe along with his mother. Canada's unemployment rate rose to 6.1% in March. That's up 5.8% from February. And in BC, the unemployment rate rose from 5.2% last month to 5.5% now. We've had a lot of people um, come into British Columbia. And so um, thinking about the job growth at the same time as immigration, and sometimes it takes a little bit of time for those two things to align a bit more. StatsCan's monthly report says the economy lost just under 2,200 jobs overall, but 60,000 more people were looking for work. The biggest job losses were in accommodation and food services. Health care and social services are the largest gains. Youth unemployment remains stubbornly high, though. And as Anise Dari tells us, it's becoming more difficult for university graduates to find a job. It's a year into the job search for Surya Narashan. It's been pretty tough because I've applied to sort of like 80 plus jobs I believe at this point and often you don't even hear back. He says employers want what a recent grad can't give them. Because techs ha had a lot of layoffs often these new grad and entry-level positions I'm applying for I'm competing against people who have had years of professional experience. Tech is just one sector to see job losses last month but it's happening across the board in some cases. Younger people are accounting for the bulk of the uptick in, in job seekers. Economists point out people aged 15 to 24 haven't seen job gains for more than a year. The labor market is growing too quickly um, and job creation is not keeping up. So it is a bit challenging out there right now for recent graduates. Higher population without more jobs is part of the issue, but so is an economy that's slowing down. University career centers see it firsthand. What we've seen is a lot of students expressing more anxiety, a heightened sense of anxiety as a result of the pandemic, but also a lot of the economic conditions that are constantly evolving. Students are noticing too. There are all these very qualified young graduates who can't get a job. I do think the university has a lot of good career resources, but there's only so much they can do. Experts say lower interest rates might trigger relief. Once firms see that people are spending money again, um, you know, they're seeing that their profits are improving a little bit. That's when they'll start saying, okay, things are, things are ramping up. Maybe we can add staff to the picture. But that will take time. No help today. I want to continue and use those skills I spent hours and hours learning, but you know, eventually I'll just transition to another direction if nothing works out. For now, the job search continues. Anise Hedari, CBC News, Calgary. Canada's spy agency says both India and Pakistan tried to interfere in Canada's past two federal elections. That stark assessment is contained in documents tabled at the Foreign Interference Inquiry. Ashley Burke has the details and the reaction. Order, please. A big focus of this public inquiry is on China's election meddling attempts. But for the first time, documents show India was the second biggest threat actor and tried to interfere too. It's fair to say that, you know, uh, the, the, the behavior of India has been of concern in the last couple of elections. A newly declassified summary of Canadian intelligence, some could be single sourced or uncorroborated, says a body of intelligence indicates that a government of India proxy agent may have attempted to interfere in the democratic process in 2021 including possible illicit financial support. Is it fair to say that Indian foreign interference targets uh, a number of high priority individual races rather than the, the general election to influence outcomes in favor of candidates considered favorable to Indian policy interests? I think it is uh, absolutely fair to say the purpose of foreign interference is to, to maximize the interest of the foreign part party. Before the 2019 election, Canada was watching another country too, Pakistan. Documents say CSIS did something rare. It deployed what's called a threat reduction measure that CSIS says worked. Typically what happens is that CSIS will try in some way or another to put itself be between somebody perpetrating 
um, an act of interference and, and the target. So that could be simple, as simple as, as posting a, a marked police car, uh, you know, outside um, a known threat actor's, um, you know, residence or, or place of work. The Prime Minister says the government still sees China, India and Pakistan as a threat to Canada's electoral systems. That's why we have put in place significant measures to counter foreign interference. The Prime Minister, key members of his inner circle and cabinet ministers will face the public inquiry next week. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. New national data says patients in all provinces are waiting longer for hip and knee replacements and cancer surgeries than before the pandemic. Christine Birak looks at the progress that has been made and the obstacles still in the way. Canadians are waiting longer for more procedures compared to 2019. We're still seeing the, I think, lingering effects of the pandemic. But researchers also say more surgeries are happening, which means... Things are trending in the right direction. But there's a long way to go. The goal is to have 90% of Canadians have their hip replaced within 26 weeks of a booking date. The latest national data reveals in 2023, the number was only 66%. Ontario did better at nearly 80. All other provinces fell well below average, including BC, Alberta and Quebec. PEI had the longest waits. Similarly, 60% of Canadians had their knee replaced within the goal. In Ontario, the number was higher. All other provinces fell short. In Quebec, just 38% had their knee replaced within about six months. As we've ramped up all of our capacity, we are looking at doing more cases than we're actually funded for. Some Ontario hospitals collaborated to do as many surgeries as possible. Here at Humber, the province only funded about 1,500 hip and knee surgeries last year. Some hospitals may stop at that cap because many hospitals are in a lot of deficit um, given the current climate. Humber performed 2,300 with help from fundraising. There needs to be a recognition of this problem and, and uh, accountability and how we're going to solve it. The Canadian Orthopaedic Association recommends running hospital operating rooms evenings and weekends, stabilizing staffing and adds data should guide fixing backlogs. It's not just about, you know, counting wait times. It's, there's actually individuals who are affected by this. And with an aging population, the demand for procedures is only going up. Experts insist the best time to properly equip our health system was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. A magnitude 4.8 quake has hit the U.S. East Coast. After the break, more on the shakeup and the minimal damage it left behind. situated right now right next to the King's College building on campus. Tons of people walk by the spot every day. Very few people actually know what it is. This is Canada's oldest observatory um, right here on the UNB campus. These artifacts were original to uh, the William Bryden Jack Observatory. Um, so they're, you, most of them were made around 1850 into the late 1800s. Some of my favorite pieces are right here. This is a subset of our collection of hand-painted slides. These were painted by William Bryden Jack himself. He painted these in order to bring them on his public tour of New Brunswick. So he toured the province giving public lectures to help increase interest in science, in astronomy. Um, but the coolest thing is that some of these slides actually move. So you can see what a partial eclipse would look like, what a total eclipse would look like. In like a little movie.
Do you feel like physics is kind of having a moment in pop culture right now? <laughs> uh, absolutely. I feel like physics is getting its spotlight right now. I mean, everyone is really excited about the total solar eclipse coming up on April 8th. We've been getting tons of phone calls, emails, questions. You know, even my family are interested in what I do all of a sudden. So, <laughs> so yes, I do think we're, we're having a bit of a moment and we're enjoying every second of yeah. it. Hey, I'm Rohit Joseph. Vibin' is the new show all about discovering great new songs and fresh artists from across BC and beyond. Stream Vibin' on CBC Listen. Israel's military says it has now fired two senior officers. It's after an investigation into an airstrike on Monday that killed seven aid workers in Gaza. Canadian Jacob Flickinger was among those killed. Re uh, Chris Reyes has more on the latest developments, but first a warning. Some viewers may find images in this story disturbing. Israel has admitted to targeting a world central kitchen van after mistaking an aid worker for a Hamas gunman. That finding from an internal investigation into Monday's deadly airstrike that killed seven members from that humanitarian team in Gaza. It should not have happened and we should uh, draw the right conclusions and implement lessons in order for this not to reoccur. World Central Kitchen has issued a statement calling for more accountability. Its founder, celebrity chef Jose Andres, issued a statement saying... We demand the creation of an independent commission to investigate the killings of our WCK colleagues. The IDF cannot credibly investigate its own failure in Gaza. That call echoed by the UN Secretary General. But the essential problem is not who made the mistakes. It is the military strategy and procedures in place that allow for those mistakes to multiply time and time again. Fixing those failures requires independent investigations and meaningful and measurable changes on the ground. The U.S. has demanded that Israel do more to protect civilians in Gaza and to allow aid to come into the enclave. It's very important that Israel is taking full responsibility for this incident. It's also important that it appears to be taking steps to hold those responsible uh, accountable. Uh, even more important is making sure that steps are taken going forward to ensure that something like this can never happen again. At an emergency meeting at the Security Council, anger from both the Palestinian and Israeli envoys. The killing of the aid workers from the World Central Kitchen is not an isolated incident. It is confirmation of what you all knew for months now. Israel is targeting those that the laws of war were established to protect. Hamas chose to fight from within civilian population centers in Gaza and as heart-wrenching as it is, tragic mistakes can happen. Israel has told the UN that it plans to meaningfully increase the amount of aid getting into Gaza. Without it, the Secretary General has warned that the enclave faces imminent mass starvation. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. 
Turning to the U.S. now, where millions in the Northeast were jolted by a rare 4.8 magnitude earthquake that shook New York. Tremors were felt as far away as the Canadian border. Philip Lee knocked now on the surprise shaker that caught many off guard. The view from atop the Statue of Liberty as an entire city trembled. The 4.8 magnitude quake rattled millions in New York and across the U.S. Northeast, including those attending a U.N. Security Council meeting. Yeah, you're making the ground shake. <laughs> Striking near Lebanon, New Jersey, just after 10 a.m., it could be felt as far away as Philadelphia, Boston, and even parts of Quebec, more than 1,000 kilometers north. You want to take this thing? With many sharing their experiences. We felt this rumbling on the floor and it felt like there was a subway going under us, but it was longer than when a train would go under and I thought, is that an earthquake or not? I uh, felt uh, my head and uh, my stomach was shaking. I was scared. I've never felt one before because I grew up in New York and we don't really have them often. So I, I thought it was a train personally and then it just kept going. So that was pretty crazy, to be honest. Um, I was really scared. While there were no immediate reports of injuries or significant damage, the quake did cause some disruptions. With traffic halted on bridges, tunnels and train tracks and minor airport delays due to safety inspections. Officials urged people to get back to normal as quickly as possible. New Yorkers should go about their normal day. Uh, first responders are working to make sure the city is safe. Earthquakes are rare on the U.S. East Coast, but this Canadian expert says there's always some level of danger. So we can have earthquakes pretty much anywhere in the world, even though they're less frequent and tend to be smaller uh, in the eastern regions. She also says buildings east of the Rockies in both the U.S. and Canada must be designed to survive earthquake magnitudes of up to 8.2. Philip Shannock, CBC News, Toronto. Karis Hogg is back with her BC Wide Weather Forecast. Before we get to that, Darius Madavi, that science nerd, is heading off to see the solar eclipse a little closer to where it's actually going to be seen. So what will he and others actually get to see? Well, good question, Dan. Uh, he's going to the eastern part of the country, and so he is going to see a lot more <laughs> than we are here. If we take a look at this, so this is the percentage of the sun that is eclipsed. This is happening on Monday. Total eclipse, you can mm -hmm. see it's coming right eastern Canada. That's where, and that's where Darius is going to be over mm -hmm. there. Uh, so way over here. Mm. Where we live. BC. <laughs> it, not a lot, right? No, no. 20%, 20, 20 uh, eclipse over in our part of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but the other story here is the, the cloud. Right, so wh what are we looking at here? So the gray part here is the cloud. And, uh, and if we zoom in on BC, really on Monday, mm. the province is mostly covered in cloud. Yeah. So, you know, that 20%, you're not really probably gonna even see much of that because of how much cloud cover there is. Mm. But it's not just cloud, it's also precipitation. So taking a look at the precipitation forecast as we move into the weekend, uh, it increases. And it's mostly along the coast to start, but then we do end up getting some, uh, some showers and some rain into the rest of the province as well. Taking a look at today's highs, very average, uh, 13 degrees for Vancouver, 15 for Abbotsford, warm in Kamloops, 16 mm. degrees, a little chilly in Dees Lake, uh, but this is pretty normal for this time of year. Taking a look at tomorrow, pretty much the same. And then on Sunday, it starts to cool down a little bit as that cloud increases and also we get uh, some more precipitation. So tomorrow, looking at BC, the precipitation mostly along the coast, as I mentioned, but it'll be sort of scattered showers on the south coast. Sun in the central interior and the southern interior as well. Kamloops 16, uh, a little bit of scattered showers over in the Kootenays as well. And, uh, and then just taking a look here mm. at the five day forecast for Metro Vancouver. We've got tomorrow a chance of showers and a high of 11. Sunday showers, 11. Monday periods of rain, 11, and Tuesday, a chance of showers, 13. That's a lot of different types of showery <laughs> things happening. And then we get back to a mix of sun and cloud on Wednesday. Wonderful ways to say rain. Yes. And 
Karis. It's Friday, and you know what that means. It's time for... I'm not as steady as Karis was doing that. Darius, Look. what are you doing here? Karis bringing us the weather reports today. Darius couldn't leave us yet for Eastern Canada for Fun Fact Friday. So earlier this week, we told you about Emerson, the elephant seal, and today you have an update on the fellow. Yes, well, uh, Emerson really enjoyed being in these very high traffic areas with a lot of people. Uh, you can see him here lazily in, uh, in a nice dirt patch. Fresh on the tulips, uh, dude. Yeah, I know. Uh, not just the tulips, though. People, mm. uh, off-leash dogs, really. Elephant <laughs> seals can pose a risk to them, especially because they get quite grumpy when they're molting. Mm. Uh, so today, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans announced that a team did manage, after uh, quite a struggle, to mm -hmm. load the elephant seal uh, Emerson up and take him to a, a new home where he can be a little bit further away from people and live a happy life as he uh, spends his month on land molting his, uh, his skin. Now, elephant seals undergo what's called a catastrophic molt, Yikes. which sounds really bad. Bad, yeah. But uh, it's natural. It happens every year. Uh, you, what happens is they lose their fur for the summer because uh, you don't need all that winter fur in the summer, as well as the top layer of skin underneath that fur. Uh, now, molt is just a term for any time you really lose the top layer of anything. It could be horns. Uh, when you brush your hair and you find hair in the brush, you molted. Uh, so oh. catastrophic molt sounds a little bit more dramatic. But overall, uh, just, a, just a part of growing up uh, yearly for any elephant seal. Now, Emerson is just a juvenile. He is a young male. Mm -hmm. uh, you, might, you might notice that he's sort of lazing around much like a teenager would, although all elephant seals do that. But uh -huh. if we look at an adult elephant seal, you'll notice they have this fantastic trunk, hence the name elephant seal, uh, elongated nose or proboscis. Now, uh, adult males develop these, females don't. Uh, and so uh, Emerson is just a juvenile. He hasn't developed his nose yet. Uh, but once he does, he will be just like the, uh, the adult friends he has, a 2,300 kilogram, five meter long mm -hmm. monstrosity. Who, in the best way. Who once a year may come into your tulip bulb <laughs> center and just decide to let his skin loose. Oh, yeah. Fun. Thanks, Darius. Have Thanks. a good time. Thank you. A BC woman formed an unlikely new friendship with an eight legged creature. That is, after initial frightening embrace, more on this close encounter right after this.
The anticipation has been strong for today's final four matchups in the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament. As Jamie Strashen shows us, superstars like Iowa's Caitlin Clark are making this year's March Madness appointment viewing. Clark eyes up behind the back through the left. There is no athlete generating more buzz right now than the University of Iowa's Caitlin Clark. Clark looking to turn the corner. Her team is set to take on the University of Connecticut in the semifinals of the NCAA March Madness tournament on Friday. And Clark again. Ticket prices are nearing $1,000, more than the men's semifinal. I think that really puts into perspective uh, what exactly where women's basketball is going and the type of you know excitement around our game. More than 12 million people watched the women's quarterfinal between Louisiana State University and Iowa. More than every major league baseball game played last year. Clark is one of a growing roster of college players making a name for themselves. Edwards, aggressive to the rim. Including Kingston, Ontario's Aaliyah Edwards, who plays for Connecticut. We're not only a hockey country, we're trying to be a basketball country as well, so um, a lot of love up north and I appreciate all of you. Longtime University of Saskatchewan and former Canadian national team coach Lisa Tomitis says all of it is good for the game, but says calling this a moment diminishes decades of work. I don't like that because it seems, you know, it refers to something that's fleeting then. I think for those of us who've been in women's basketball have you know, recognize this for many years that this has been going on. There's been no shortage of talent. The increased spotlight on not just basketball, but also hockey and soccer could attract a new generation of fans and athletes. Women can actually start to get to know these other women that are in this space because before it felt like out of sight, out of mind because they weren't even visible to you. So you didn't even know they existed. And then Aaliyah Edwards right here uses her footwork underneath the basket. For those who've spent a lifetime building the game, it's a long time coming. Proving that it's not how you start, it's how you finish. Jamie Strash in CBC News, Toronto. Very cool. So, there are many benefits to a big hug. Emotional, physical, all that kind of stuff. But one woman in Victoria got a little bit more than she bargained for when an octopus seemed to take a liking to her. But what started off as a fearful moment became a lot more meaningful. Have a look. Hey, baby. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> He's on my leg. I was terrified because I looked down. I was in the octopus suit and he had his tentacles wrapped around both my legs and the grip was so strong. It felt like I was getting my blood pressure taken on my calves. I was shaking and I thought that was it. I thought I was going to die. I thought he was going to spray me with that venomous dye and there was no escaping. All of a sudden, I just told myself, okay, I have to calm down. I'm going to have a heart attack. And then miraculously enough, he calmed himself down. And then he loosened his grip. And then he floated away a little bit. I had so many comments saying, pet him, pet him, pet him. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so afraid. I did. I pet him. I watched his horn stand up and he seemed to enjoy it. And I kind of felt this really weird connection with him. I guess I've had about 10 encounters with him now. Like, I'm actually starting to fall in love with this guy. He's like a little ocean puppy. He comes to me and just me, no one else. I'm the chosen one. <laughs> what? Chosen one for an octopus? That, that I, I, I'm, mm, I'm jealous. A little bit, yeah. I don't know. I can see. For the record, according to Ocean Conservancy, the ink from an octopus, not poisonous. So... No, okay. no, but it'll ruin your outfit. Oh, yeah. So don't go down wearing white to the beach. No, don't do that. Ever. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, like, as moist mm -hmm. hugs go, like, I kind of <laughs> want to have that. I don't know. That looks very cool. I mean, if it had to be moist, might as well be from an octopus, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Okay, good. Right We're on there the in the water? Magical. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for being with us tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. You can watch the newscast on CBC Gem, our free app, as well as on YouTube and our website, cbc.ca slash bc.